Well, good morning. Welcome to Genesis. We're so glad you're here in person and online. Um, we're just excited to be with you. So this morning as we start our worship, we'd love to invite you to come and join us in worship this morning.
You know our thoughts and our hopes. And our concerns and our worries. Father, right now, I pray that you would meet each of us where we are. And let us know that you've given us freedom, Lord, to lay that all down before you. All the good, all the bad at your feet. So this morning, I pray that you would just come and find us and you would just prepare our hearts, prepare our minds for everything that you have for us today. In your name, Lord. Amen. Hey, good morning. Welcome to Genesis Church. Whether you are sitting here in front of me or whether you are watching us online, it is great to have you with us this Sunday morning. Or I guess if you're watching online, it could be Tuesday night, Thursday afternoon, whenever it is. We're thrilled that you decided to spend an hour with us. Uh, let me just mention to those of you who are watching us online, we apologize, our internet went out, and apparently you need that to do a live stream. So you guys are just joining us. So just a reminder, if you wanted to uh, watch the worship portion of this, if you head to our website at any point after this service, genesisli.com, we will have the whole service streaming there for you. And again, our apologies to you this morning. For those of you who are joining us in-house, we're glad to have you here. And just a reminder and a thank you to each of you for complying with what we are complying with, which is CDC guidelines that we wear these doohickeys all the time, okay? So just a reminder, have those on. And at the end of service, we'll sing the last song. You guys don't mind taking a seat. And then we will dismiss and head directly outside. Okay, so what is happening at Genesis Church? Couple of things. First is not happening, okay? So just a reminder, there is no Facebook Live on Tuesday night happening. At the moment, we will be back with you in a couple of weeks with a whole new series, a whole new season of Tuesday nights. But there is something very exciting coming on October 8th. And on October 8th, we are starting a new season of what we are now calling Next Gen Youth. Okay, so if you are in, 6th through 12th grade, okay? So if you're in 6th through 12th grade, we have a new season. It's going to be a new night. It's going to be on Thursday night. There's going to be a new person in charge of it all, of course, because we have Faith now as our next-gen director, which means she's taking care of our kids, and she's taking care of our youth. But I'm excited. So if you are in 6th through 12th grade, if you know somebody, if you have kids who are in that age group, if you are within distance, of course, of our building here in Medford, that is going to be happening on Thursday nights now for you. Just one last reminder and a thank you to each and every one of you for your continued faithfulness in giving week in and week out. You have blessed us to no end over the past six months, the way that you have continued to give. And those are the ways that you are able to do so. So check and cash, even for those of you who are in person, there's no more offering buckets, okay? So beside the doors, there are now two black boxes if you wanted to give that way. Most of you nowadays, of course, are doing it the other two ways. So you can text uh, your giving or you can give online. And we really, really, really appreciate the fact that you continue to do that week in and week out. All right, here's the boss. Okay. Yeah. That's right. I'm the boss on her day off. That's it. So, good morning. It's great to see you. Those of you that are joining us, despite the complications um, online as well for our service, happy to welcome you um, wherever you are joining us from this Sunday morning. And uh, of course, it's always fantastic to actually see people in front of us because. For six months, <laughs> for six months, we did Sunday morning services to a totally empty auditorium. So um, thanks for coming. It's way better. Uh, love it. Just, just a, a little explanation. Our Tuesday talks um, were scheduled to start uh, in October. Uh, my life got a little bit messed up the last couple of weeks with some medical challenges and things. So in all honesty, what's happened is I am behind preparing the Tuesday talks. 
So it's going to be a couple of weeks yet. We're going to do a fall Bible teaching series on Tuesday nights on our Facebook page called The Journey. And uh, it's going to be called The Journey from Con Man to God's Man. And we're going to follow the journey of the life of Jacob in the Old Testament and see what we can learn from it. And there's a lot for us today. So that's what's going to be coming up there. By the way, next Sunday morning, October the 4th, is our church's 22nd anniversary to the day. <laughs> to the day. 22 years ago, October the 4th, 1998, there was a handful of us with a vision and a mission and said, let's give it a shot. <laughs> and here we are, those years later, and God has been so good. We set out that first week with one simple mission in mind. We exist to seek and to save those that are lost. And I'm just happy to tell you, we haven't deviated, we haven't changed it, we haven't gone sidetracked, we haven't become introverted. This church exists in the words of Jesus to seek and to save those that are lost. So if you can, you know, if, if you can join us next Sunday, or please make a point, whether it's online or whether it's in person. And let me just uh, emphasize this. Um, don't be cautious about in person and think, oh, maybe I'm taking a seat somebody else wants. As soon as we reach that scenario, we can do two services. We've done that before, you might remember up until March of this year. So there's no issue there, whatever. We will make space to accommodate everyone who wants to come while still ensuring that we follow the guidelines to do our best to keep everybody healthy, okay? So next Sunday, anniversary, 22 years. Lord, we were young then. Well, maybe not, but I was younger. All right, so let's pray and then we're gonna turn to God's word, okay? Father, thank you for the blessing of being able to worship together just for the joy of fellowship with like-minded people and, Lord, of being able to shut out everything else and just lift our hearts and our voices to you. And, Lord, in these moments, we pray, Lord, would you speak to us as we share your word. Let us hear you, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So last Sunday, Charlotte launched a new teaching series called Songs That Inspire. And uh, what we have been doing, or what we're going to do with this series, is we're actually going to be looking through some very significant uh, chapters in the book of Psalms and looking at some of the songs that are there. I'm not a big music person, to be honest. Uh, a few months ago, our son was with us. We were driving somewhere. He said, Dad, it's quiet in this car. <laughs> I said, yeah. He said, but you're not playing music. I said, no, I generally don't. And he said, no, no, we need some music. So he takes out his phone and he sinks his phone and he's got this stuff just banging in my ear. And it's like, no, no, when I drive, I drive. I like peace and quiet. It's good. I like time to think. It's fine. I don't need music. But, but there are some things that really inspire me. Years ago, before we actually moved to the United States, I've got to tell you this. I love the national anthem. I used to watch things like the Olympic Games as a Brit, hoping Americans would win so I'd hear the Star Spangled Banner. No, I just loved it. I'd get teary-eyed listening to the Star Spangled Banner, and here am I, an Englishman, sitting, you know, living over there. But it, but it did something. In, f in fact, you know, I've actually given up on professional sport for a whole bunch of reasons, but anyway. Um, if, if we went to a ball game, I'd go into City Field because that's the only place to watch baseball in New York. And uh, I would... <laughs> Great. I'm waiting for half of you to leave now. God bless you. You are very gracious people. But I'd go there. I'd always get there early. There were two reasons I'd get early, be early to a game. Number one, I wanted to park somewhere near the exit gate so I wasn't in a line of a thousand cars trying to get home at the end. Number two, I wanted to be there for the national anthem. I remember about three years ago taking some friends the UK, from the UK to City Field. It took us three hours to get there. 
There was issue after issue on the expressway. Three, whoops, three hours it took us to get, to get there. And you know what the biggest thing for me was? I'm watching the clock. And it's 7.04, I'm thinking, I missed the national anthem. Yeah, it kind of, that's a song that really, re really inspires me. Oh, say, does that star spangled banner yet wave or the land of the free and the home of the brave? I tell you, I'm more American than a lot of Americans are, and I've only been American for 20 years. There are songs that inspire me. Like this morning, I do listen to the radio in the car, Sunday mornings coming to church. I listen to enlighten on Sirius, which is the older songs, and they play hymns on a Sunday morning, okay? Some of you need to ask your parents what they were, I guess. But anyway, they play hymns, and those hymns connect me kind of with when I was younger and my past. And this morning, as Jill and I are driving here, they're playing an old hymn called The Old Rugged Cross. That was my mother's favorite. When we were kids, there was a radio, there's something on the radio on Sunday evenings, Sunday half hour, and they, 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 they were hymns. And I can remember laying upstairs in bed and hearing my mother singing along with the old rugged cross. That, that hymn still inspires me. To the old rugged cross I will ever be true. Its shame and reproach gladly bear. And I love that song. It inspires me. It's old. But what we're looking at now is songs that were written thousands of years ago that actually still inspire me today. And I hope what I'm going to share this morning is going to really inspire you. And my pick for this Sunday morning is Psalm 27. Now, Psalm 27 is a psalm that I, I guess I, I just, actually I could quote the whole thing for you, but it would have to be in the King James Version, because that's how I knew it, that's how I learned it, that's how I'm comfortable, and that's how I'll quote it this morning, because I trip myself up if I tried it in another translation, right? The opening declaration of Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom then shall I be afraid? That, folks, is inspiring. And if you needed me to tell you that's inspiring, then what's up? Right? Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to read that together. Are you up for this? You ready? And, and like, read it like you mean it, okay? Even if you don't feel like it this morning, read it like you mean it. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Wow. And there are three very positive declarations in, in that opening statement of Psalm 27, right? And I just want to look at those firstly today. Number one is this, the declaration, the Lord is my light. The Lord is my light. You know, that's why being here on a Sunday morning is such a good thing and such a blessed thing. We come away from a world that is in absolute turmoil, a nation that seems to be turned upside down and getting worse right now, but we remind ourselves today of this eternal truth, the Lord is my light. Thank God. The Lord is my light. In Psalm 36 and verse 9, it says this. For with you, talking about the Lord, with you is the fountain of life. Look at this now. In your light, we see light. In your light, we see light. A number of years ago, Jill and I went down to Georgia for a weekend and for the distinct purpose of visiting a number of churches and basically seeing how they do church and what we could do better. And so, so we did. We visited four churches uh, it, over that weekend. We went to one Saturday night, we went to two Sunday morning, and one Sunday night. Sunday morning, we went to a church and uh, 
after their service, we drove to uh, a church that is the church is pastored by Andy Stanley, which is one of the biggest churches in the country, North Point. And we went to North Point and drove there. We arrived for like their last service, which was 1130. It was a beautiful sunny day. We walked inside and the doors were open for us into their auditorium. But I had an issue. Because it was a sunny day, my glasses had gone dark. The auditorium had virtually no light because the band was playing and all the light was on the stage. And when they opened the door and we walked into the auditorium, it freaked me out because I could see nothing around me. All I could see was the band. And by the time, by the time we were guided to a seat and sat down, I was so freaked out, I wanted to get out of there. Now, I know if any of you do amateur psychology, you realize I'm nuts, but that's the point. If you've been with us any length of time and didn't work that out yet, what's the matter with you? Right? So, so, so but I was, I, no, I was, I was just so totally disoriented that I couldn't sell. And, and I couldn't, like, it took me a while to settle down. And, and then we found Andy Stanley wasn't there preaching. And I thought, oh, my dear Lord, this is probably the worst church in America. And it's not. It's one of the best, you know, but because I was, it was dark. I didn't know where I was. I didn't know where I was going. Hey, and we've all been there in life. The Bible reminds us of that. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And we've all been there. The, the Bible says that's where we were before we knew Christ. Blinded. Blinded. We couldn't see it. Darkness surrounding us. And then we discovered the good news. The best news. John chapter 8 and verse 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but will have the light of life. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. I don't want to sound harsh here, but I wanted to say this. If you feel today like your life is shrouded in darkness, maybe you need to look around and see if you're following Jesus closely enough. Because Jesus said, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. Never walk in darkness. If you are afraid today, where's Jesus? Who are you listening to? Where did you wander off? Because following him means you never walk in darkness. I remember when I first came to Long Island, you do a lot of things differently here to what we did them in the UK. A lot of things. I, I remember I was going to do my first funeral, and I was given this advice. I was told, now here's what you do. When you leave the funeral home, there's the hearse, there are the family cars, and then as the pastor, you get right in behind the family cars. And I thought, that's rude. You know, it's like, I'm the pastor, make room for me. It's like, no, I'm not going to do that. So I didn't. I, I was courteous because that's we're British. That's how we are. I was polite. So I let everybody else go. And I came tagged along the end. Until I came to a point where a couple of traffic signals had separated me from everybody else. And I was new to Long Island, and I had no idea where I was going. I was afraid, you know, somebody, somebody was going to have to do the committal and the burial because I wouldn't actually get to be there. Now, thank God I made, you know, thank God I made it up and I found them again. But you know what I do after that? I always follow the hearse. <laughs> I always, I'm sorry, I'm going to cut you off because, you know, what? I need to be there because they expect me to say some words. So, I'm sorry, I'm going to be there and I'm going to... I'm going to really put myself right there up front to make sure I get to be where I want to be. Listen, follow the light. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Those who follow him will never walk in darkness. 
the Lord is my light. I'm going to say that again, and I'm going to invite you to say amen when I finish. Is that all right? If you don't want to, that's good. That's fine. That's all right. We'll talk about you. All right, are you ready? Right? The Lord is my light. Amen. Isn't that terrific to know? Hey, I've got more for you. Here we go. The Lord is my salvation. Amen. How about that? The Lord is my light and my salvation. You, you, you know, some, sometimes, we get, sometimes we get tempted to fear um, uh, about our standing with God. And, and those are times when we need to remind ourselves of this fundamental statement. The Lord is my salvation. My salvation is not founded upon how good I am, how good I've been, how much I've prayed. The Lord is my salvation. Or as the old hymn puts it, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. The Lord is my salvation. I, I, I've had a couple of interactions recently with people who were very disturbed about the fact they feel they might have kind of offended God so much that they've lost their salvation. Very genuine fears. And, and, and they'll quote one, what, basically they quote one of two scriptures whose meaning is not 100% clear and, and said, this is what I think I've done. I, I want to tell you something. You don't pin your fears on one single scripture that is not crystal clear. You hang your hopes on the wisdom of the whole book. And the wisdom of the whole book is this. I am saved. I am kept by the grace of God himself. So there's the story of Jonah in the Old Testament. Most of you will be very familiar with that, right? He didn't want to do what God wanted him to do. And so you know the whole deal. He goes to flee in the opposite direction on a boat. There's a storm. And, uh, and in the end, he ends up getting thrown overboard. He gets swallowed by a whale. And uh, in the, when he's in the, you know, like the insides of the whale, in the stomach of this whale, in the middle of the ocean... Jonah makes this great theological declaration. Here's what he says, Jonah chapter 2 and verse 9, real simple, salvation comes from the Lord. God, you are the only one who can save. And I want to tell you this, it's good to remind ourselves before we get in the belly of a whale in the middle of the ocean, but sometimes when we're feeling down in the depths a bit ourselves, it's good to remind ourselves salvation comes from the Lord. Or as a song we often sing puts it, I, I, don't des I didn't earn it, I don't deserve it. I don't. I never did. I did nothing to deserve my salvation, nor did you. In fact, we did stuff to really put us in the opposite direction. Salvation is God's doing. John chapter 3 and verse 14. Jesus said, the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Those who believe have eternal life in them. You and I who are followers of Jesus have eternal life within us. You know what eternal life is? It's eternal. If you're visiting today, that's about as profound as I get, but we do have other preachers. All right, so, but, but, but that's it. Eternal life is eternal. It means we will live forever. Those who believe in Jesus are going to live forever. Salvation belongs to the Lord. It comes from the Lord. So, so here's from this song that inspires today. I've got this. Number one, the Lord is my light. Number two, the Lord is my salvation. I'm not my salvation. Anything I can offer by way of credentials is not good enough for my salvation. The Lord is my salvation. Thank you. And then the third thing it says is this, the Lord is the strength of my life. Wow. The Lord is the strength of my life. Remember, remember God told the Apostle Paul, 
he said to him, my strength is made perfect in weakness. God is our strength. Jesus told a story in uh, Matthew 7, 24, 25. He, he said this, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the winds blew. The rain came down. The streams rose. The winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. Do, do you remember, was it perhaps about three or four weeks ago, we had that like tropical storm, almost hurricane, that had a name that nobody could pronounce, right? I mean, why do you bother doing that? No, really. Like, can't you find someone else that begins with an I? You know, there's, there's loads of names that begin with an I. You don't have to give a hurricane a name that nobody can say. But anyway, do you remember that one? And, and, and you know, when that really started getting going, uh, th that particular thing, it was a Wednesday afternoon. You know what I was concerned about? Um, our house was in contract, and we were going to be closing on the sale within a matter of days. And I'm praying, saying, God, the last thing I need right now is a tree on my house. <laughs> I, no, I was terrified. I, I really was well, terrified. I was anxious with that storm anyway because, you know, we, we had a load of trees, and Lord knows how long they've been there, longer than I've been alive, and, uh, and they're there, and, and who knows the state of them, and it's like this will be a really bad time for a tree to come down, God. Now, we had lived for 15 years in the northeast of Scotland where the weather is interesting to say the least. And we had some horrific storms there. In fact, you know, the, the, the highest wind speed on the British mainland, which was 169, I think it was, miles an hour, was recorded just about three or four miles away from our house one night. Um, we didn't call that a hurricane. We called it a windy night. But... Uh, we, uh, but you know what? There were no trees anywhere around us. <laughs> the weather was so wild they didn't grow. They really didn't. For about four miles inland, there were, there were no trees. And our house had been built with stone. It was right on the shore that was blasted out of the shore. It was made with solid stone three feet thick. It, wasn't, it didn't have a proper foundation. It just sat on the rock. And it had been there, according to the deed, when we bought it, it couldn't say when it was built. It said at least 200 years. So that house was built on rock, and it was going nowhere. We had an old slate roof. That night of the high winds, we lost one slate off the roof. That was the whole of the damage that was done. But here, I was terrified of <laughs> the little breeze we had that afternoon. Here's the thing, when your life is built on your faith in Jesus Christ, you don't have to be afraid whatever storms may come, because you can say the Lord is the strength of my life. And I want to tell you this morning, if you're in a position where you feel like the winds are blowing and the rain's beating down and you see it looks like kind of the water's coming up around you. I want to tell you this, if your life is built on Christ, you'll stand firm. You'll stand firm. Nothing, nothing will bring you down. The house won't move. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom then shall I be afraid? If God's got us, the only thing we need to be afraid of is something that's bigger than God. Let me know when you find an answer to that, will you? But that's it. If God's got us, that's the only thing we need really to be afraid of. So there are three declarations in this psalm. The Lord is my light. The Lord is my salvation. The Lord is the strength of my life. You know, Charlotte was encouraging us last week to really get into the 23rd Psalm and to really kind of just draw everything we could from it. 
I'm going to encourage you this week to memorize Psalm 27 and verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom then shall I be afraid? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom then shall I be afraid? And those of you that are here in person, I'd love for you to go to that door this morning with your head up high and just saying to yourself as you get back into life, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom then shall I be afraid? And those of you watching at home, just walk out the front door and walk Walk around the yard and shout it to your neighbors. <laughs> or, or not, but that's up to you. <laughs> Get in your car tomorrow morning going to work and remind yourself, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom then shall I be afraid? Okay, now let's, let's come to, we, we like to keep it pretty real here, right? So let's just, let's just acknowledge this. That is not a state of mind most of us constantly live in. Is that okay? You went quiet there. No, just being honest, right? Sometimes we do get anxious, right? Sometimes we do get concerned. So, so most of us don't actually live there. But I'll tell you what this is. This is a position of faith we need to consistently pull ourselves back to. It's a position of faith we need to consistently pull ourselves back to and remind ourselves. You need to know these words. You need to be able to say them to yourself over and over and over again. At the start of a good day, as well as in the middle of a crisis. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom then shall I be afraid? You, you know what? They become so much a part of my life that when I sit down to read in the mornings, it's kind of every, every day this comes, these words come to my mind and become my confession. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom then shall I be afraid? And sometimes during the course of the day, I've got to pull myself back into that position. But that is truth. The Lord is my light. The Lord is my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Now, to be, I could preach Psalm 27 probably for months. There's so much stuff there. But what I want to do for a couple of minutes now is jump over from the opening verse to the last verse. And the last verse reads like this. Verse 14. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart. Wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. Psalm 5 and verse 3, the, the, the writer puts it like this. He says, in the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my requests before you and wait expectantly. Wait for the Lord. Some of you are freaking out perhaps about life right now. The encouragement from God's word to you today is, Lord, your light. Lord, your salvation. The Lord's the strength of your life. Wait for the Lord. Now, sometimes it seems as if he's uh, just hanging, you know, waiting a little bit too long and things are really, really just going to fall apart. But they won't. They won't. There's an old, old story that preachers love to tell, and I generally don't tell it because it's been told so often, but I'm going to now, so here we go. It, it's, it's, it's about a, a, a world-famous violinist, Paganini, and Paganini was playing a concert someplace, sometime, I don't know, um, but as he got up to play, he kind of fine-tuned his violin. And then as he started to play, one of, one of the strings snapped. And he just pulled it off, and he retuned his violin, and he started again. As he started again, another string snapped. 
And that happened again. So in the end, he's left with one string on his violin, and he's meant to do a concert. And you know what he said? He said, one string and Paganini. And he played the most unbelievable concert they had ever heard on a single string on a violin. Listen, if every string in your life snaps and there's only one, it's one string in God. It's one string in God. Wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. Don't try to botch something up in your own life and put together and screw it up even more. But what you really need to do is to wait for the Lord. And, and you know, we've been doing Bible readings every night, as, as most of you probably know. We do it on our church Facebook page at 9 o'clock. And uh, I've been reading through the book of Psalms, and we've been doing nightly readings for over six months now. And uh, this last week or so, while I was kind of a little bit out of action, different folks did. And the, the other evening, Faith, Faith read one of my favorite Psalms, Psalm 126. And Psalm 126 starts with this statement. It says, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Let, let me just interpret that. Basically, they're saying, when God answered our prayer, we couldn't believe what he did. I love that. They've been praying for God to help them. They've been praying for God to deliver them. They've been praying for God to, to meet their needs. And they say, when God did it, it was like a dream. It was so unbelievable. Wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and and take heart. I want to encourage you today to trust God without wavering. And maybe this Sunday morning to pull yourself back into a place of believing Him and leaving things with Him. Verse 13 of this psalm, he says this. He says, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You stop believing, you stop hoping, you lose heart. But he says, I believe. I believe to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And I want to encourage you today to wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart. Now, you may be sitting here, sitting at home today and say, I'd love to be that positive. I'd love to be in that kind of place. What's the secret? So how did David get to be living that kind of way? And you know, I do think there's a secret to this that's right in the middle of this psalm in verse 4. Here's what he says in verse 4. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. How did he stay in this place of confidence? The Lord is my light. The Lord is my salvation. The Lord is the strength of my life. I will wait on the Lord. I will be of good courage. What, what enabled him to stay there? And I think this verse is the secret. He said, there's one thing I want from God, to be in God's house all the days of my life. Now, I don't think he meant he wanted to be a priest who hung out in the temple all day long or one of the Levites who looked after all the aspects of taking care of the temple. In fact, in David's day, there wasn't a temple. He wanted to build a temple, but God said, no, you're not the man to do it. Uh, he said, your son can do it. So actually, David... David got the land that they would build the temple on and worked on the plans for a temple, but, but it wasn't his to do. So he, he actually didn't build the temple. There was no temple. So when he says, there's one thing I've desired, I want to dwell in the house of the Lord all my days of my life, he wasn't saying, I want to be in church 24-7. Or was he? Because a key component of church, the key component, is the presence of God. 
And you know what I think David's saying here in Psalm 24? There's one thing I want more than anything else. I just want to know the presence of God. And, and if we want to be able to say, the Lord's my light, the Lord's my salvation, the Lord's the strength of my life. If we want to be able to wait on the Lord, to be strong and of good courage, here's, here's the thing. One of the things we need to do is to treasure the presence of God. He was saying he constantly longed for God's presence. The Apostle Paul said at one point, he said he, said he discounted everything else for this one thing. He said, I want to know Jesus. I want to know Jesus. How do you stay positive in a negative world? Pursue the presence of God. Cherish the presence of God that brings the peace of God. Now, I'm going to say this. You know, the temple wasn't there at the time. This isn't the house of, this isn't God's house either, but it's a special place. That's why so many of us are really happy to be back here, right? Yes was a good answer, but don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> you missed the moment. But, but, but really, but, but really, isn't that, you know, because, because actually in the fellowship of other believers and seeing them around us and being with them and, and, and the blessing of corporate worship, which is so much different than personal individual worship, it's very special indeed. And this place becomes special because we meet God in, and have met God in special ways here. We've lived through six months of the new normal which was no gatherings, public gatherings. And now we move on to the next normal, which is as we are able and feel comfortable to actually be here worshiping. And uh, I appreciate, I, I have no idea where we're at with what was going wrong technically this morning, um, but I do know that um, there was a major technical issue, and I'm assuming we're up and, or will be up and online at some point. Um, but but here's, here's the fact. You know, I'm just blessed that as well as everybody who's here, we reach hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other people every Sunday too. And, and some will never be able to be here probably. Like we, we were, there was a couple that were in touch with us this week. And um, I want to give a shout out to Phil and Linda who are in Washington State. And, and Phil told us that their pastor who'd been with them for 25 years had retired and moved. They're doing everything online there and things weren't the same online. They tried another church online, and then they found us. And, and, and he said, he, you know, we're not ready for in-person services yet, but we need to be part of a church. And so, hey, welcome Phil and Linda, who are a part of Genesis Church from Ephrata, Washington. I only just know where Washington is, let alone Ephrata. And there, there are hundreds of other people in that kind of situation. And, and, and I love that you can worship with us. And there are a lot of people who live more locally who are a little bit uh, you know, concerned and feel it's wise for them right now not to be in a larger group of people. And I totally respect that. I am going to say one word, though, to perhaps another group of people. It's easy in the last six months to have got very relaxed about Sunday mornings. And it's a heck of a lot easier to roll out of bed later, make your coffee, sit on the sofa, and watch the service. And I want to tell you, there may well be some of you watching who really should be here for your sakes and for ours. And I want to encourage you just to take a look at what's what, okay? That's no pressure whatever on those who say, because I'm concerned about health, I can't be there. I'm just saying, if you've got a bit slack about, ah, you know what, I won't bother tomorrow, I'll watch it on TV. No. You know what the Bible says? It's good, it's a pleasant thing when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. One thing I desire the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. By the way, don't rant about church being essential unless you're really making church essential to you. Okay, I won't dwell there, but you got the point. <laughs> Here's the thing. The current climate in our country will suck you dry if you let it. It will leave you angry, afraid, confused. And my closing encouragement to you is this. 
Let this song inspire you and be your declaration. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom then shall I be afraid? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, I pray you'd help us to just hide and guard your word in our hearts, to remember who you are and who we are, and Lord, to just walk in the knowledge that you're my light, you're my salvation, you're the strength of my life. Help us, my God, I pray, to desire your presence above everything else. Amen. 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 Hey, let's stand and sing with the band this closing song. And then as Charlotte mentioned, please be kind enough to take your seats after the song. And we're going to invite you to then go straight out and fellowship by all means in the open air in the parking lot. It's a nice morning out there. Bless you.
God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you next time.